Hi, this is dedicated to the god Apollo. I want to look at what makes Apollo interesting to someone who is concerned with living well, with a the pursuit of happiness with a philosophical way of life. Apollo has a lot to offer. I want to look at him in his attributes, his defining characteristics, which I find very interesting. Uh, some of the, the myths we have about Apollo and his temple in Delphi. I'm Michael. Welcome to Philosophy for the Living. This is Apollo and his Oracle. I'm recording this one week before the winter solstice of 2021. Uh, I want to publish this or I want to put this out on the winter solstice because Apollo is a god of light. It seems appropriate that on the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year when darkness reaches its apex, this is when I would put out a video dedicated to the god of light who would then begin to return uh, into our lives. 2021 has largely for me been defined by my discovery of Apollo. I'd known of him for for decades, but hadn't appreciated him really until this year. So for me, this is a personal video. It's really defining for for this year, which has been a momentous year. And but Apollo has been the the standout feature of this year for me especially through Homer, um, but just general approach. But before I get into the God, uh, I thought it would be good for me to warm up to my theme, get my voice working. One of the things that I've been working with with Apollo is entrusting my voice. So in these videos before, I've most of my work has gone into writing scripts and and then this year, uh, Apollo is a god of prophecy. So I have learned to trust my voice by, in a way, I think of it as giving my voice over to Apollo and letting Apollo be my inspiration, letting Apollo speak through me. You know what? Now I think of it, I, uh, I need to do an invocation here. So Apollo, Lord of the Silver Bow, I am your voice. Be my inspiration. <sighs> Speak through me. Let your healing light shine into our world. Okay, here it is. Now we're ready. Uh, okay, um, before I get into Apollo directly, I wanted to talk about how I've been working with him. You just saw it. This is part of it. Learning to trust my voice. I thought it would also be good for me to begin by mentioning um, Plutarch, one of my favorite philosophers. Plutarch was a priest of Apollo in the temple at Delphi. Plutarch, the philosopher, Platonist philosopher, also a priest at Delphi. One of the reasons I love Plutarch is that he, more than most other philosophers, was really concerned with living well. Plutarch is famous to us mainly for his biographies. He wrote biographies on uh, many Romans and Greeks. He didn't write these biographies in our way of uh, just fulfilling curiosity. He was a philosopher, so how does a philosopher use biography? Plutarch examined the characters of these people and how their characters gave shape to the, the narrative arc of their lives. He wrote his biographies as examinations of character and lives so that we could learn from them, so that these examples of lived lives could help us in our own lives, um, which to me is, I, I, I think, is probably the best way to do philosophy, to really examine 
examples of life and see what we can learn from them. Now, Plutarch was a philosopher and a priest at the Temple of Delphi. I think this is my dream life, right? If I could, if I won some cosmic lottery and was allowed to choose one of my former lives, I would choose to have been Plutarch so that I could work here. This place, I've never visited it. Just looking at the pictures and knowing what it represents, I feel something special about Delphi. Its associations with prophecy and philosophy. It's almost enough to make me believe in reincarnation, how drawn I am to this site. You know how people say things like rock and roll saved my life. And I feel that right when uh, when music came into my life, my trajectory was changed for the better is not even words for it. Apollo, the god Apollo did that to Socrates. So before we can appreciate the the influence Apollo had on Socrates, we need to know a little bit about the backstory of Socrates. Now, this is the Socrates you're not going to get from Plato or from Xenophon, but this is a Socrates we have preserved in a comedy written by Aristophanes. This is a comedy called The Clouds, and this is portraying the early Socrates. This is Socrates as a young man, and it's very different from the, the Socrates that we come to discover in Plato, the Socrates that we all think of, right? We think of Socrates as an old man. Well, he wasn't always old. Now, when he was young, we see in the clouds, he was more of what we would think of as a scientist, actually. So the beginning of the clouds, we see Socrates is climbing. This is a comedy, remember. We see Socrates climbing into a hot air balloon so he can rise up because he wants to get measurements of the sun. And he thinks, if I can get in this air balloon and go up higher, I will get more accurate observations of the sun. And then he comes back down and then he says, hmm, I'm going to analyze and examine this gnat, right? This tiny, tiny little insect, because he wants to find out the buzzing sound that gnats make. Is that from its mouth? Or does it make that sound with its anus? Uh, the, the joke here, um, what Aristophanes is pointing fun at, is the idea that Socrates was concerned with the astronomically distant, studying the, some star so far away, or the microscopically small, you know, with, an at, with a gnat. He's a caricature because he is concerned with things that have no real bearing on human life. That's the early Socrates. Now here comes the story with Apollo. One of Socrates' friend, uh, a guy named Chirophon, decided to take a trip from Athens. He left Athens and, and traveled to Delphi and asked the oracle at Delphi, so asked one of the high priestesses who serves Apollo. Chirophon asked, is anyone wiser than Socrates? And acting as the mouthpiece of the god Apollo, the high priestess said, no one is wiser. So these are the words of Apollo coming through the mouth of the high priestess. No one is wiser than Socrates. This forever changed Socrates' life. He had a saying that he knew nothing. Now the God has said that no one is wiser than him. 
This fundamentally changed Socrates' life. He stopped giving attention to uh, the stars and the you know the microscopic, and he started thinking about the people around him. He started really to be concerned with his community and his neighbors. He started examining life and how it was lived in his community. <laughs> the question we have to ask is, when it comes to prophecy, all prophecies are creative. When the priestess delivered the words of the god Apollo, those words changed history. When Apollo said no one is wiser than Socrates, those words created Socrates. This is when Socrates really begins to go around and to talk to his neighbors and to ask them questions. What is piety? This was an important question to him because he's on this divine mission. He is inspired by Apollo to find out, I think I don't know anything. God says, no one's wiser than me. Well, how can this work? This is what we call cognitive dissonance, where Socrates believes he knows nothing. The God says, nobody's wiser than Socrates. So Socrates goes and he starts examining the people around him. Ask this person, what is piety? What can you teach me about piety? Ask this person, what is justice? What can you teach me about justice? Ask another person, what is courage? You notice these questions all have to do with life, how to live well in a community. The prophecy created this Socrates that has been passed on to us. That story with Socrates and Apollo, that is true. This is a historical event. Chirophon really did travel to Delphi. We, you can see the ruins of Delphi, right? This was a true practice where people would ask questions of the high priestess and the high priestess would speak on behalf of Apollo and deliver an answer. A man named Chirophon really asked, is anyone wiser than Socrates? The high priestess really responded, no one is wiser than Socrates. This is a historical truth. There are also myths associated with the Temple of Delphi, the Oracle. One of these, um, maybe most important, is Oedipus, the story of Oedipus. Oedipus, hmm, without going into too much of the story, Oedipus went to the oracle and asked, who am I? And the oracle responded, you will kill your father and marry your mother. Oedipus, as a result of this, never went back home. What he thought were his parents were not his parents. The direction that he fled toward is where he actually met his father and killed him and then married his mother. He didn't know these people. He had never met them before. The prophecy of Apollo changed Oedipus's fate. Prophecy is creative. It generates a new future. If Oedipus had never asked a question of the oracle, he would have stayed with his adoptive parents for life. And his story would have been unremarkable. Now, the problem is that Oedipus was dealing with a kind of... Mm, blood guilt, generational guilt, which we don't 
it's, this is interesting, right? We don't like the idea of guilt being passed on uh, generationally, but we do talk about trauma being passed on generally, ge- but through the generations. This is the same idea here. So Oedipus's family has a lot of trauma, a, a, an incredible amount of trauma involved here. And Oedipus is the final receptacle of all this, you could say, trauma. It's guilt. It's this bad juju, right, has come down to Oedipus. When Apollo sets him off into a direction where he will encounter his father at a crossroads and kill his own father and then come into a town where there is a widow. He will marry the widow and later discover that this is his mother, that he himself had killed his father. This is the working out of trauma that has been building up in this family for generations. Oedipus himself, after committing these horrible crimes, becomes untouchable and he blinds himself. He goes into exile. He's wandering and really just trying to purge himself of this crime that he has committed. He becomes almost godlike in how polluted he is. No one wants to be near him, but he because he is so polluted, there's a kind of power in him. And Oedipus becomes transformed. He's something like a, a scapegoat figure in that the guilt and the trauma of his house is condensed into this one character. And he will take all of it down with him. But also, because of this power that he has collected into himself, there is a, a blessing associated with him that wherever he is buried, he will be a sort of protecting uh, spirit wherever he's, da- wherever he's buried. So actually there's some sort of negotiations in the, in the end of, of his destiny. He becomes a protective spirit and people want him um, to be buried in their town. Apollo, by setting Oedipus toward his particularly horrible fate, Apollo is causing generational trauma to be worked out. And it begins with the question, who am I? We're going to see this recur. Apollo is very much connected with themes of identity and self-knowledge. Oedipus asks, who am I? He gets an answer he did not expect. It changes his life. It creates a new life for him that heals trauma that goes back several generations. He comes to know himself. He comes to know who his true parents are. This is how Apollo works. On the on the walls of the temple at Delphi were written commandments. Commandments on how to live well. The first commandment was know thyself. Nothi seuton, know thyself. Self-knowledge is um, central to Apollo. This is, this is the kind of God that Apollo is. Self-knowledge, it could be, you know, this sort of uh, mystical, spiritual sense. Um, but just very quickly, I would like to say that there is also a traditional, very practical sense about uh, what know thyself means. Uh, know thyself, know that I am I am human and I am therefore mortal. So when I know that, when I know what I am, I know that I'm not going to live forever and therefore um, 
I can make a limited amount of choices in my life. And this gives value to my choices. I can't do everything. So what I can do, I need to create priorities in my life. Um, know thyself also means to know my particular characteristics. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And how do they impact my life? I'm good with language. It's appropriate that I would be a language teacher. Uh, I'm not, um, I don't have very good eyesight probably not a good idea for me to be a pilot you know what I mean so know thyself has practical applications but we there is also this sense of deep identity who am I and Apollo is encouraging us to explore this as with Socrates and Oedipus when Apollo sets us on this path of self-discovery this commandment is creative this isn't a prohibition this is a an admonishment get to work on discovering yourself and that changes the course of destiny another commandment written on uh, the temple of delphi was nothing in excess Apollo is a god of, of light and self-knowledge, nothing in excess. Apollo is also a god of balance and measure. This relates to Apollo as the god of poetry and music. Now, normally when I hear about balance and measure, uh, th this can, and self-knowledge, this can start to sound very, very rationalistic. But when we think of balance in this sense, it's important to remember that this is mostly in connection with Apollo as the patron of poetry and music. Balance and measure. A line of poetry is balanced. Music has measure. This is the kind of balance and measure that Apollo wants to bring into our lives the idea that the balance and measure that goes into poetry and music, if we bring them into ourselves as well, that will help us to uh, live better lives. Apollo was the, the leader of the muses. And it's really when you open up all of this that Apollo is the god of light and poetry and music. I've, through Socrates, we already have seen that Apollo is related to philosophy. This, this is when I'm surprised that I haven't always been, <laughs> that I haven't always adored Apollo. These attributes are incredible. I feel like I'm, um, everything good in my life comes from Apollo. He is a god of healing. Apollo, with his arrows, could send plague, which, again, maybe it's appropriate that I didn't really discover this god until 2021. Apollo sends the plague with his arrows. Because he has this power to send plague, it also means that he has the power to heal. Apollo is the god of healing. His son is Asclepius. Asclepius is a human who gains the power of medicine. And in the ancient world, there were temples spread around the Mediterranean, temples to Asclepius, this mortal son of Apollo. So Apollo gives his healing powers to his son Asclepius. And so Hippocrates, for example, was working in Hip, we think of the Hippocratic Oath. This is the origins of, of Western medicine. Um, these were, this grows out of 
the temples of Asclepius, which this power ultimately comes from Apollo, is a god of healing and light and philosophy. If I could have, if I could court a patron deity for philosophy for the living, it has to be Apollo, right? Over the summer, as I was really uh, getting into Apollo uh, with some depth and developing that uh, my appreciation for Apollo, I thought it was unconnected. I began to develop an, a mental image of uh, where I was in my mind. It was it was called a map of the soul, and I was thinking of. The, sort of like a flow chart. If I were to create a flow chart for myself, what would that be? And this image just came into my mind and started forming itself, right? It was generating itself. I didn't understand this as connected with Apollo, but looking back on it, you know, with uh, the benefit of hindsight, here I was uh, developing an appreciation for a god of of healing and self-knowledge at the same time I'm developing a map of the soul uh, I think that I can I can attribute this mental creation to the influence of Apollo so what I've done is in this in this map is to see again I, I describe it as a flow chart I, I label it finally is soul as a healthy energetic system and what i understand when i look at this is that all of these this is not looking at me as a material object but i'm looking at me myself as as energy in motion so instead of talking about my stomach i would talk about my appetites um, and what you're seeing here is an energetic flow, how the body influences the heart mind, how the heart mind influences the body and the will energy is flowing through all of this when I am healthy. So disease is when energy gets blocked. When one of these parts sort of seizes up that brings disease throughout the whole system. The use of this image is that because everything is interconnected, if one part gets blocked, I can loosen it up by, uh, by working on the parts around it. So yeah, this is just something that came to me over the summer. The soul as a healthy energetic system, I, I feel personally that I received this from Apollo. This is a gift I received uh, that helped me with my own um, self-knowledge. Uh, I have, you know, had, well, like anyone, right? I've had struggles in the past and looking at this map helps me to understand where those struggles were located. And also looking at this map, I see how how I can heal myself, how I can uh, pull myself, put myself in better positions to to feel better and you know to live better, to be more likely to experience happiness. Anyway, yeah. So in relation with uh, Apollo as a god of healing, I think it's not a coincidence that at the same time I discovered him that this image of of the soul came to me. Okay, I've talked about myself and my relationship with Apollo. I've talked about Socrates. Now let me get into the really important stuff, the myths. Why Delphi? Why is this the location of Apollo's temple? Delphi was the sacred precinct of Gaia, the earth goddess. Specifically, Delphi is the location of the Umphalos, the navel of the universe. 
This is the center of the cosmos, the omphalos, the navel, the belly button of the world is located here in Delphi. It was sacred to Gaia, the earth mother goddess. Gaia had a serpent that protected this space. This serpent monster was called Python. That's the the origin of our English word Python. It was this serpent monster who protected the Umphalos for Gaia. This, so Python, was also a monster with prophetic abilities. And as it happens, um, Python was a uh, was a monster, was, was a true monster, and was, and, uh, was killing. So Apollo comes to Delphi and kills Python with his arrows. That is how Apollo gains control over the site of Delphi. It's very easy to see a connection between a male sun god coming in to subjugate a mother goddess. This is the patriarchy asserting itself over the matriarchy. What I find interesting about this temple, this temple of Apollo at Delphi is that, yes, the male god Apollo assumes control over a site that was sacred to the mother goddess Gaia. And after this defeat, Gaia does not play much of an important role in Greek myth. She sort of fades into the background, becomes obscure, and Apollo is ascendant. But what I find interesting is that the high priestess is Apollo's oracle. He's a male god, but he doesn't have a high priest. The high priestess speaks for him, and the high priestess at Delphi was known by another name, the Pythia from Python. The high priestess had her gift of prophecy. It was thought somehow through Python that because Apollo had defeated Python, these powers of prophecy were passed on to his high priestesses. What exactly are these high priestesses doing? Let's look at the practice. So the way uh, the practice worked at the Temple of Delphi, people would travel to Delphi to ask a question. This isn't like a church where you have a, a weekly service. This is a place, a, a pilgrimage site. You travel here with a question. You ask your question of the high priestess. The priestess delivers an answer, and that's the practice. So how does the priestess speak for the god? Well, uh, th this is a bit involved, right? So. The priestess, the high priestess, the Pythia, the oracle, sits on a stool, a tripod stool, that is straddling a crevice in the mountain. And vapors come up through this crevice that, well, this is deliberate intoxication for entheogenic purposes. The high priestess would go into a trance, and in this trance, 
the god Apollo would enter into her and move through her. This is how the words of Apollo come from the mouth of the high priestess through this ecstatic state brought on by vapors coming out of the mountain. And I mean, we can visit the site now. Delphi is still there, but um, the crevice no longer um, gives gives out these vapors anymore. There's an interesting geological history that you can look into if you're curious about that. But it's because of this. So the temple was only open. It was not open during the winter. It was only open once a month because it was a bit of an ordeal for the high priestess to enter into the state. She couldn't do it every day. So she had to prepare herself for this um, deliberate intoxication. And then afterwards, she had to recover. So you come with the question, the high priestess is in an ecstatic state. She answers on behalf of Apollo. And, and the answer is public. I love the idea that of a religious ritual practice that encourages the formation of questions. Just imagine all of these people traveling from all around Greece and later from all around the Mediterranean, traveling with questions. Questions have, are creative. They generate, questions generate answers. And I love the idea that you come to the high priestess to ask a question. When you ask a question, you assume that there is an answer. This is all very creative and generative and, and it just seems so perfect that it would be associated with Apollo. That's the high priestess. Now here, at this point, I'm thinking of Diotima. Diotima is a, or was a, a wise woman who instructed Socrates. Socrates is famous as the teacher of Plato. Plato was the teacher of Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Uh, we don't hear as much about the teacher of Socrates, Diotima, this wise woman. She's not a high priestess at Delphi, we, we don't think, um, but she is portrayed as someone who initiates Socrates into mysteries. She is a priestess of sorts. This is central to Plato's philosophy, which has become, it's my philosophy now. What Diotima teaches, these mysteries are, this is philosophy as a way of life. Diotima tells Socrates about the mysteries of love. She initiates Socrates into these divine mysteries. I'm still learning this. I'm still, this is something that I, I still have to improve myself so that I can receive this. The idea is that love, when I fall in love with someone, we're talking about erotic love. When I fall in love with somebody, what happens is that I recognize beauty in this person. That's the beginning. That moment of recognition when I see something beautiful, it starts a chain reaction. Uh, okay, so first, you could say that I, I fall in love with a beautiful body. And after a while, I begin to recognize that it's not just the body that's beautiful, it's also the mind and the heart that is beautiful. And I see and I recognize how when this person walks into a room, the room lights up and I recognize this beauty and this is love. This is erotic love for a person. 
as this continues, as this process unfolds, I begin to recognize that it's not only that I love this spirit, I also love the room that lights up for this person, right? That when I begin to recognize beauty in a body, soon I recognize the beauty of that mind and that heart and that spirit. And then I start to recognize beauty in many places. And this process continues. And this is spiritual ascent. This is what Platonism is really about, is about growing in love and recognizing beauty. That is the that is the process. And I'm still learning how to do that. We meet Diotima in the dialogue, the symposium, Plato's dialogue, the symposium, where Socrates describes his encounter with Diotima. Earlier in the symposium, Aristophanes, that same comedic playwright we talked about earlier, Aristophanes tells a story that is the origin of the Western idea of soulmates. Uh, this is an amazing story. It's put in the mouth of Aristophanes, but in this case, Aristophanes is a character created by Plato. So really, it's Plato's story. Um, put into the mouth of Aristophanes about soulmates. Since we're talking about erotic love, we better talk about soulmates and where they come from. So Aristophanes says in the beginning, people were these ball type creatures and we would roll around because we were round. And these ball creatures had four legs and four arms and two heads. And because we had two heads, we were super smart. And because we were balls, we were able to roll around very quickly. We were very fast, we were very smart. And we were like perfect creatures. And the problem is that we started to get out of hand. We started to create a ruckus. And at some point, the gods noticed and Zeus caught on to what was happening and Zeus said, you know, I got to I got to take care of this. So he sent down a thunderbolt and split these creatures in two. That's when we got created. The thunderbolt came and divided these ball creatures into two halves. So now we only have two legs, two arms and one head because we have been divided from our other half. Um, our soulmate truly is our other half. And this is why we feel this need to, to merge with our beloved, right? It's not enough to sit next to our beloved, right? We actually feel a desire to completely melt into them because we used to be one, according to this story. Uh, now, this story is 2,500 years old at this point, and it, it amazes me at how it seems like we still haven't caught up to it yet. Okay, so these original ball creatures came in three varieties. You had a solar male. This was a male ball human. When he gets split in two, he becomes a gay couple, two gay men. So the original ball male gets split into two gay men. There was an original lunar hermaphrodite. When this creature gets split in two by Zeus's thunderbolt, that separates into a heterosexual couple. So heterosexual male and female comes from the original lunar hermaphrodite. There was also an earth female. 
and Zeus's thunderbolt splits the earth female into a lesbian couple. So this is the origin of the idea of soulmates, that there really is an other half that we have been separated from. Now, what, okay, we we're talking about erotic love, so it seems appropriate to get into soulmates. Here comes Apollo. This creature has been severed in two by a thunderbolt, and there's obviously a huge gash running down part of this creature. Apollo comes, and where the gash is, he pulls the skin and wraps it up tight and ties the skin into a knot. That is the belly button. He then takes the head and turns it around. So originally our heads went backwards. Apollo takes the head, turns it around so that now we can look down at our belly buttons and be reminded of what we have lost. This is poetry of the highest order. When we talk about navel gazing today, we think of somebody being self-absorbed and just only concerned with themselves. In, in this story, to look at the navel is to be reminded, well, this is a question of identity, right? Who am I? Um, self-knowledge, what am I? But it is to know that I have lost something fundamental to who I am. As an individual, I'm not complete. The process. I need to grow in love to become everything I was, to be healed. I need to remember who I was.